worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and he parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. Come on, there's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout. We'll continue to sing. We sing to the God. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. See, hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Now we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Oh, come on, church, sing with me. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. All right, lift your voice. Here we go. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in His place. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out. Sing the name of Jesus, amen. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. And I speak Jesus. Yes, I do. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. That 
be our prayer today. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear, over fear and all anxiety. Every soul, every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Yes, I do. Your name is power. Come on. Name is power. Your name is peace. Your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the dark. For every enemy, Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on, church, lift your voice. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Come on, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, over every enemy, for my family. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. All right, let's hit another gear. Come on, church, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over it. in your presence I speak Jesus church sing that chorus with me your name is power your name your name break every break every shine through the shadows Burn like a fire. Oh, I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, oh church, we can celebrate. And you have won me. With your kindness, chase me down, you chase me down. When I was lost, amen. Where would I be? 
Your feet was in for the crossing. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner, but now I'm not. It's with your blood you, you bought my freedom. And hallelujah for the cross. Yeah. Oh, all my shame was met with mercy. And all my shame was met with mercy. Now your mercy will be my song. All oh, the glory. And all the glory, and all the power of the cross, hallelujah, and hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, and now I'm not, it's with your blood, you, you bought my But now I'm not with your blood. Cause with your blood you bought my freedom and hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How was he praised? Would you thank our team that led us this morning? Would you do that? Amen. Amen. I appreciate them so much. And uh, Pastor Morgan, uh, that was a good song, by the way. I like that. I don't normally like your new songs, but um, <laughs> that sounded bad. Until I've heard them a few times, okay? I don't like change. Y'all don't understand how much change just messes with me. And and um, they, he's learned to not ask me if I like the new song because I was like, no, it's terrible. And, uh, but give me a few weeks and it's grown on me like mold and amen. And well, that was probably a bad analogy, mold. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. I, I warm up to it. But that was a really good one. Yeah. Um, <sighs> aren't you glad we can have a good time in the house of the Lord? Amen. I, I don't want to be a part of stuffy church. I just don't. I don't want to be a part of it, and so we're not going to do it here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Take your Bibles and go there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I want to speak to you on this subject. It's really a question, and the question's very simple. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm going to pick up reading in 1 Thessalonians 4. Starting in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 
verse 13. If you found it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, but I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, just so we're all on the same page, this is Paul the Apostle writing. He's not calling you a dummy. He's not saying you're, you're dumb or you're stupid. The word ignorant here just means you just didn't know. Nobody had told you, okay? Keep that in mind. I didn't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, the fallen asleep, so you understand the context, is those who are dead, okay? Uh, is a kind way for him to say it, that they've fallen asleep, um, but they're, they're dead. They're, they're not with us any longer. He said in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Lord, may you add your blessing to the reading of the word. I pray that, Lord, during these next moments that we have together, that, Lord, that you would convict those who are not saved of their plight that is ahead of them. I pray that, Lord, there would be great conviction of those who have been religious but not been saved and that today on this day not next week or the week after but today they'd repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ I pray this morning Lord for those who know you and have been saved that God that we would do a deep examination of our life this morning according to this text and ask the question if we're ready are we ready to stand before you as our judge and our king Lord, speak to us now, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I thought this was funny. I'm sure some of you have heard this. I think I shared with you once uh, this story. It was, a, it was funny to me whenever I read it, a, a family that had decided that they needed a new um, uh, answer or, or message on their answering machine. I know people don't have answering machines anymore. Probably a couple of you still do. Um, but most of us don't, and they got together with their three-year-old son and thought, well, we'll put him on there. That'd be cute. A matter of fact, I still have Carly Joe. and if y'all call my number, you'll still hear Carly Joe's sweet little voice from when she was like two, um, and uh, it annoys most of my preacher buddies. Like, how old is she, 30 now? Can you get her off of there? 
Um, but anyway, this family had got their three-year-old little boy and his cute little voice, and they had rehearsed what he is to say uh, when, you know, the, the time comes. That uh, my mom and daddy are not uh, available right now. Please leave your name and your number and a brief message, and they'll get back to you as soon as possible. You know how they all go. Well, it come time for the real deal. The test is on hand, and, and, and they, they hit record, and sure enough, the little boy starts in. My mommy and daddy are not available right now. Uh, please leave a, a brief message in your number, and they'll get back to you just as soon as Jesus comes. <laughs> and I think that they kept it and they used it. Amen? And, and I know some of you are thinking, well, that's how long it takes for you to get back with me, preacher. I'm telling you, I will get back with you. Um, it, it's funny as that is, there's a, there's a bedrock truth that I, I want to get across this morning. If you don't get anything else, you need to get this and take this home with you. He's coming back. He's coming back. This is a, 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 this is a, a bedrock truth that we anchor our faith to. Not just that he is a God who came, but he is a God who is coming back. Matter of fact, as a boy growing up in church, we didn't shout about much, but we shouted about this. This, this was nothing, nothing like the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ seemed to stir in the people of God uh, emotions like this subject. He is coming back. John 14, 3 said, if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and I'll receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. And the call for us as believers is to live our lives in light of that truth that he is coming back. And not just is he coming back, he's coming back soon. And these two different comings are... Uh, they're, they're fun to contrast. If you look at the, the first time he came, he came as a, what, a baby in a manger. The second time he comes, he's coming back as a resurrected king and Lord. The first time he came to, to wear a cross, the second time he comes, he'll be wearing a crown. The first time he came, he came as a suffering servant. The next time he comes, he's come, coming as a, a conquering king. The first time he came, Judged by the religious crowd, the second time he comes, he will judge the religious crowd. He's coming back, church, as sure as his coming was the first time, his coming the second is true. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14 says this, we are, and this is really the, the summation of where we are today, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, the word special there, another uh, translation would use the word peculiar. I think that might be King James is the word peculiar. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean weird. We got enough weirdies, amen? I mean, it, it's not a call for you to, to live like a, a weirdo. That, that's not at, at all. But, but it is, <clears throat> he's saying a, a particular, a peculiar people, a special people set apart for what? For good works. Good works of, of reaching people far from Christ and bringing them uh, into the kingdom through the gospel. So I want us to wrestle in these next moments about this question, am I ready through our text this morning i want to i want to examine it and show you some promises i think that are here uh that i hope would encourage you uh this morning the first is a promise of comfort in verse 18 of chapter 4 look in verse 18 of chapter 4 it says therefore very simple comfort one another with these words with what words the ones he had spoken previous where he said that i don't want you to be ignorant I don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope. The picture he's dealing with here is, a, is kind of a funeral picture. Uh, talking about those who in Christ had died. Uh, by the way, that's pretty common amongst us. Okay, um, And when they die, there's always these questions. And by the way, Pete, while I'm here, let me just say something about that. 
we need to probably do a little bit better job of checking our theology about those who have died in Christ. Because if there was ever some wacky stuff that gets said, it's going to be over the death of a loved one. Now, I understand you're quiet here because we, 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 we're all kind of prone to say some, some wacky stuff. Like if they love to play baseball, he's playing baseball up in that great diamond in the sky. No, he's not. He's not. Uh, or we'll say that. Here's a common one. Oh, another angel got its wings. Nope. Mm -mm. This is not true. Now, again, your mama may have been an angel, but she didn't on earth. But she didn't turn into an angel. She didn't get wings, and no other angel got their wings. The Bible gives us a lot of help when, if we'll trust it, if we believe it, and I do, that those who die here are ushered into the presence of Christ. Listen to me. Immediately, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Instantly, boom, I mean, we're translated, we're, we're, we're graduated to heaven, we're there with Christ. But he gives us this strong word that says, I, I want you to be comforted of the fact that there's going, and, this, and that's the first part of this, that there's going to be a reunion. I don't know about you, that just stirs something in me. Why? I've got some folks I want to talk to. I've got some people I can't wait, Pastor Sam, to embrace when I get there. I can't wait to hug their neck. I can't wait to just go walk around on the, the, the shores of heaven with my grandpa who I've never met. I've heard about him my whole life, and I can't wait. I've heard you talk about your grandpa. Man, wow, how fun, Steve, is that going to be? Just to hang out and just chat for, hey, we'll be back in 10,000 years. You remember, time doesn't matter there. Time's a big deal to us now. It ain't going to matter there. We're just going to hang out and just, you may skip rocks out on a pond. I, I don't know. I just, I know this, there's a reunion. There's a coming back together with us. This comfort of, uh, promise of comfort also reassures us of the sovereignty of God in control over the universe. By the way, I, I don't want to serve a God who is not in control. I don't want to serve a, a, a little G God that I have to instruct him on what he should do. This picture here he gives us is that God is large and in charge. It declares Christ's kingdom will be triumphant. That this great battle that will bring all to a head one day, that we're on the right side if we're on the side of Christ. That there's, somebody help me, amen. Y'all like, well, bless God, only if we eat our Wheaties. No, if we're saved, we are on the right side. If we're born again, we're on the right side. Sometimes we almost kind of portray as though that Satan and Jesus are in this great battle. They're going back and forth and back and forth. And man, I'm so thankful that Jesus is 51% strong and, and, and the devil's just 49 Are you kidding me? He is the creator of the universe. The devil is a creation. With a snort of his nostril, he can squash him like a bug. He's defeated. What Jesus is giving you here through the pen of the Apostle Paul is saying, y'all chill out a little bit. Y'all calm down. And have you ever noticed how, though we grieve, and I think that's as normal as normal can be, when we lose a loved one, somehow we're always surprised that it would ever hit our family. Like, oh, I didn't see this. It's coming. Whether it happened instantly or whether it happened through long drawn out sickness, all of us have an expiration date. This tent, that's what, I like how Peter did that. He called this a tent. This tent's going to expire. That's a good word, amen. Some of y'all trying to preserve that thing like you're going to live in it forever. I'm going to get a new house, amen. It's a, it's a promise of comfort. 
verses 1 through 3 of chapter 5. He gives us a promise that has a, a, a caution uh, along there with it. Look in verse 1. But concerning the times, the seasons, brother, they said, You have no need that I write you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Well, what's the context there? The context there is you don't know when the thief's showing up. If you knew when the thief's showing up, you're going to stay up with a baseball bat and hit him in the head. Amen? He says, you don't know when this is coming. But he said, it's coming. For when you say there's peace and safety, he said, it's then that sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. The promise of caution is this. Boy, I need you to hear this. The truth is this. We cannot, we will not, we shall not know when he's coming back. It ain't happening. I don't care how much Bible prophecy you've read. I don't care how much TBN you've watched. I don't care how many times you've Googled it. You cannot, you will not, you shall not know when he's coming back. So I would caution you in this way, rather than spending all of your days searching for a sign, start looking for a Savior. Rather than looking for a sign, start looking for a Savior. I believe this preacher is personally deeply convicted. The next event on the prophetic timetable is the rapture of the church. I believe that's what's coming next. You say, what do you mean the rapture? I can't find that word. It's not in there, so therefore it won't happen. If that be the case and that be the standard that we would use, we can't talk about the Trinity either because the Trinity, that word's not in there. Yet the teaching of that is all the way from Genesis to the maps that we serve this triune God. This is talking about the rapture of the church. There's coming a day, I believe it, I know it's happening, that he says it with the voice of the archangel and the shout, or the shout of the archangel, the voice of God, the trumpet's going to blow and we're going up. It's going to happen that way. He's going to toot and we're going to scoot. It's not complicated, but it's imminent. We are not to know when it's going to take place. All attempts to identify signs have been proven wrong. Every one of them. I remember, some of you will remember this quite well, 88 reasons Jesus will return in 1988. Any of y'all remember that? Some of y'all? Did any of y'all come out of church uh, that fall? And have little pamphlets on your windshields of, that get told you 88 reasons Jesus coming back in 19. I remember those little pamphlets. Well, it's interesting how they always, ah, doggone, we missed it. Well, of course you did, you moron. The Bible tells you you're going to miss it. There's just, it's, it's impossible. Well, they come back and they punted and said, no, we've missed it. We're going to move it to 1992. And they missed it there, and then they came on, and what was it, just a few years back, recently. There, there's this sweeping movement, and, and initially, there's people that will come along and say, wow, man, crazy nuts, what are they doing out there thinking that? But, but, but when it gets closer, here's what starts happening. Then we start going, you think he's right? Read my lips. No! Absolutely, it's impossible for us to know. If, here's what I deeply believe. If you figured it out and set the date, he'd change it just to prove you wrong. It's just not going to happen. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Well, what does that mean? You don't know. Such teaching, listen to me, is at best a waste of your time. At worst, it can become idolatrous. It can. It can be that thing that you have, have, have served and worshipped in such a way as you are the, the smart one that's figured it out. I assure you. In the sweetest way I can say it, you did not. Number three, 
he gives us a promise with a challenge. I like this. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. This promise with a challenge is simply that it would produce in us personal holiness. Thinking about the return of the Lord should produce in the church a desire, an effort for personal holiness. 1 John 3, 3 says, and everyone who has this hope in him, meaning if we have Christ in us, he purifies himself just as he, meaning Christ, is pure. What it's doing is saying we should be concerned with the state in which we'll meet him in. I should be concerned when he, if I'm saved, because some will take this approach. Well, I'm saved. I ain't got nothing to worry about. I, I get it. We're not talking about worry. But if I am saved, please hear me. I still will stand before him as judge. Y'all get that right? There is this thing called the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. I do not, I am determined, I will not stand there before him with no crowns, no rewards to put at his feet. I will not give my life in such a way that it would be wasted to where he look and say, what did you do with the life I gave you? I want to be able to look at my life, though it's not perfect, it's so far from perfect. And look and say, I made a difference. I made an impact for the kingdom, the kingdom of God. We should be concerned for the state in which we will meet him in. Secondly, we should be concerned about our personal holiness and not just our outward appearance. What do you mean? Well, I can look very good and religious and be as filthy as I can possibly be on the inside. I can. It's really easy. All you got to do is come to church often and don't cuss in the church. I mean, that's kind of how far we've lowered the bar. I mean, just, just be a, let me zone up this, this, every one of you will understand this vernacular. Just be a good old boy. Call yourself a Christian, be a good old boy. Ladies, it mentally leave you out. Be a good old gal. Now, we're in the Midwest, we're in the buckle of the Bible. Everybody in here understands that language. Just be a good old boy. What does that mean? Just, just help your neighbor, just be, be kind to them. Don't, don't cause anybody any fuss. Don't cuss in the lobby of the church. Don't, you know, don't. Don't tug on Superman's cape. Don't, don't grab a bull by the tail and, 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 and be nice to the preacher. And that's, that's really all it takes. Yet you can do all of these things and still be far from God. That speaks of nothing in regards to personal holiness. Holiness is a matter of the heart. Holiness is often expressed in those moments when it's just me and God. Any concern with uh, biblical prophecy that doesn't result in an increase in biblical holiness is simply curiosity. And that's not helping the kingdom. It also, and lastly, will produce a concern for the lost. A deep concern for the lost. Acts 1.8, you all know this. But you'll receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He said there's power in this place, not just knowledge. You become witnesses, not investigators. We'll even do that in the church. We'll applaud those deeper lifers. The man, oh, they love to dig deep. No, no, who, who have you shared the gospel with? Which one of your neighbors is now serving Christ because of the witness that you've been to them? Because of the gospel that you've shared? Don't tell me how much you know. Don't tell me the verses you've memorized. Who are you witnessing to? Who are you preaching the gospel to? Now, if you got to hear and hear me saying, hey, my preacher said we shouldn't memorize the Bible. My preacher said we shouldn't dig into deep things of the Word. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I am telling you this. 
It's a lie from the enemy of God for you to give your life investigating the Bible and not be a gospel witness. It's a lie. It's a lie. And here's the thing. You'll have people that will applaud you while you're living that lie. Any concern with Bible prophecy that doesn't cause us to seek the salvation of the lost is mere curiosity. So here's the question. Are you ready? Are you ready? He said, comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming again. It should cause us to live significantly different than the world or the religious. It should cause us to forgive quicker, to share with more passion, to live bolder lives, to love, listen to me, without borders or boundaries. What do you mean? Thanks for asking. When I got saved, I kind of had the same idea that many that were in my circle would have, and that was this. And I know this is not everybody, but this is where I was. Um, if anything important is going to happen, it'll happen within 20 miles of the house. We, we didn't have to care about what's going on anywhere else. Um, you know, I, I get it. There, there's people over in... in uh, Botswana, I don't know, I always go to Botswana, Czechoslovakia, Um, uh, there's people in Russia, there's people in China, there's people in Japan, of course they're lost and they need to hear the gospel, that's why God has missionaries. What's that got to do with me? Can I tell you something? God really dealt with my heart as I got saved and began to study the word of God and here's what I discovered. Do you know that the The Great Commission was given not to churches, it's given to individuals. Did you know that? And did you know that Jesus loves the little boy and the little girl that's growing up right now in communist China as much as he loves your grandbabies? Did you all know that? Did you know that he loves the little Muslim boy that's growing up in Iran with a mom and daddy that may be teaching him to hate the very country that you love. Did you know that Jesus died for that little boy and loves him as deeply and passionately as he loves you? Coming to that realization helped me to understand I I can't love and serve God with limits on what he would be able to do with my life. I couldn't say, well, I'll do this and this, but bless God, if he's going to use me, he's going to be right here. How about you let the sovereign God of the universe figure out where the right here is? How about us as a people approach him today with this idea that, Lord, I am available. Use me. If that's here, praise God. We need some more here. But if that's there and and he fills in the there, who are we to say no? Who are we to say no? No. Now, if I bought into the the, the church culture that we live in today, I wouldn't be telling you what I just told you, and here's why. Because some of you may actually pray that prayer and believe it enough that God would send you somewhere and you'd leave. Because the church culture in which we exist in today, in our country, wouldn't buy it. Here's why. Well, you're not successful if folks leave your church. You're only successful if you get more and more and more gathered. I told you years back, we're no longer celebrating just the gathering. We're celebrating the sending. Why? Because we're not reaching the world to just gather a bigger crowd. We'll reach the world when we take those that have gathered and send them to the ends of the earth, starting with going across the street. So our motto has got to become this, and I'm done. We use all that we have, we use all that we are to reach all people everywhere for the salvation of souls and the glory of God. That's got to be us. All that we have and all that we are to reach all people everywhere for the salvation of souls and the glory of God. If that becomes 
who we are as a people. They'll be saying of us, as they said of those when in Acts chapter something, I hadn't planned on saying this, so it's Acts chapter something, and they went and assaulted the house of Jason. I just preached on this this week at a pastor's conference. And they said, bring us out, Paul and Silas, those who have turned the world upside down. Talking about the small number of men. And they describe them as those who turn the world upside down. Listen to me. We will not turn the world upside down if we start telling God what he can and cannot do with my life. But if we come and avail ourselves and say, Lord, the answer is yes. Don't know what the question is going to be. The answer is yes. I said it this way years ago. That in other words, we would bring to him our life as a signed blank check. And Lord, you fill in the details. Spend it however you want. My question is, would you surrender in that fashion to him today?